colleagues, dear friends, I am happy to welcome you at our interview project Modern Arbitration Live that is supported by Russian Arbitration Center and Legal Forum Academy. Uh, within this project we discuss with the leading Russian and foreign lawyers the most interesting practical issues of uh, dispute resolution and today we have a very special guest, Mr. Gary Born. Uh, thank you Gary for coming to Moscow and for coming here to us. Thank you. Um, on the one hand, uh, as you are one of the most famous international arbitration litigation practitioners, uh, there is no need to introduce you to the audience. But on the other hand, Legal Forum Academy uh, has such a broad audience in Russia and CIS that I'm sure that uh, our interview will be watched by people who don't know much about arbitration, but who want to know more about arbitration. So let me please first introduce you to the audience. By all means. Um, Gary Bourne is uh, the chair of the International Arbitration Practice Group in uh, Wilmer Cutler, uh, Pickering, Hale and Dorr LP law firm. Uh, he is also uh, the president of Singapore International Arbitration, SIC Court of Arbitration. Uh, Mr. Bourne has uh, served as counsel in more than 600 uh, 75 arbitrations, including the largest uh, ICC and ad hoc arbitration in the history, and also uh, has said as uh, arbitrator in more than uh, 250 ad hoc and institutional arbitrators. Uh, Mr. Gary Bourne has a lot of awards, including uh, Best Lawyer in the Sphere of International Arbitration by uh, Best Lawyers London, and a lot of other awards, and also uh, Mr. Gary Bourne has published a number of leading works on international arbitration and other dispute resolution forms. Uh, the most uh, famous books include International Commercial Arbitration, International Arbitration Law and Practice, and also International Arbitration Forum Selection Agreements, uh, Drafting and Enforcing. Uh, Mr. Bourne is also the Honorary uh, Professor of uh, St. Gallen University, Switzerland, Tsinghua University, Beijing, and regularly teaches in leading uh, institutions all over the world, such as Harvard, Stanford, National University of Singapore and elsewhere. Uh, so uh, I know that during your stay in Moscow, uh, you have lectures uh, in the leading Moscow universities, such as High School of Economics and Moscow State University. And I think that's really a great chance for the Moscow Russian students uh, that I could only dream of when I was a student. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, but uh, as I also usually say that now, uh, sometimes students know about international arbitration here in Russia more than practitioners elder generation. Uh, so that's why following the arbitration reform and growing interest in arbitration, uh, we are doing a lot of work here to promote modern, good faithful arbitration. Mm -hmm. uh, and we speak not only about Moscow, but only about other cities. And uh, me personally, I travel a lot and do lectures, seminars, and I need to explain the advantages of arbitration, sometimes the nature of arbitration. So what, in your opinion, my first question will be the most uh, uh, appealing advantages of arbitration comparing to litigation, both for domestic and international disputes, because domestic disputes are also important here. Sure. That's, that's a great question. And uh, before I answer it, let me say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to, to speak here today. Thank you also for the, the very flattering, overly flattering introduction. I, I appreciate that as well. Why, why is it that parties in both domestic and international cases choose very frequently to resolve their disputes by arbitration. I think there are two main sets of reasons. One you might describe as, as pragmatic or, or practical. I think of those reasons as, at least in English, the five E's. Arbitration is more efficient, more expeditious, more expert, more even-handed, and more enforceable. Five reasons that commercial parties, also states increasingly, prefer to use arbitration to resolve both domestic and also, very importantly, international, commercial, and other disputes. Arbitration is more efficient in most cases, not all cases. No, no method of dispute resolution is perfect. It's more efficient in most cases because the procedure can be designed by the parties in the arbitral tribunal based upon the specific needs of two parties or the various parties to an individual dispute based on the specific characteristics of that dispute. Instead of taking a one-size-fits-all 
set of procedures off the, the shelf, so to speak, and imposing that on an individual case. One designs carefully procedures. Taylor, Taylor makes procedures for an individual case. That means that the proceedings are not just more efficient, cheaper for commercial parties, but also more expeditious. They can be quicker. In part, they can also be quicker because arbitration doesn't involve multiple layers of, of appellate review always with the possibility that you will be returned back to the first instance court only to begin the entire process once more. Arbitration is, in a sense, one-stop shopping. You have your dispute resolved in a, a single proceeding, and, and that decision is, is final and binding. One realizes very substantial efficiencies because one doesn't have layers of appellate review. Arbitration is, I think, particularly efficient and expeditious in international cases because in contrast to domestic disputes, international disputes can be, and very frequently if the parties haven't agreed to, to arbitrate, litigated not just in one country's courts, but in two or three or four or five different countries' courts. The parties pay for the privilege, not just of one set of lawyers in one country, but multiple sets of lawyers in different countries. Arbitration is more expert for some of the same reasons that it's more efficient and more expeditious. It's more expert because not only do you design the procedures for an individual case, but you also choose the arbitrators. That's the essence of arbitration. The parties choose the decision maker. They choose a non-governmental decision maker to resolve their dispute. And they choose the decision maker based upon his or her expertise in the subject matter. The parties know better than anyone else what their dispute concerns, what characteristics, capabilities are required to resolve it expertly. And they therefore have a strong incentive, the greatest incentive of anyone in the world, to choose someone who is truly expert or a panel of decision makers who are truly expert. In contrast, a state court judge, in addition to being overworked, must decide cases involving administrative law, environmental regulations, tax disputes, employment disputes, everything in the world perhaps except the particular type of joint venture dispute or construction dispute that the party's case in an individual arbitration actually involves. And thus, especially in an international context, parties can, if they have, let us say, a infrastructure project in the Middle East, choose an expert on both Middle Eastern law and infrastructure projects in that part of the world. That type of expertise is invaluable for commercial parties, but also for states when it comes to the resolution of their disputes. Arbitration is more even-handed, particularly in the international context, because instead of having a dispute resolved on one party's home turf, a dispute against a French company resolved before a French judge, one can have a dispute resolved in an independent, neutral third country before an independent and impartial arbitral tribunal. In that sense, arbitration is more even-handed, more neutral and independent than litigation in each party's own home courts. Finally, arbitration is more enforceable. Arbitration, especially in the international context, produces a final and binding award with race judicata consequences, just like a national court judgment. Importantly, though, unlike a national court judgment, both international arbitral awards, but also arbitration agreements, are subject to the United Nations Convention for the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. The convention, with 159 contracting parties around the world, gives an enforceability premium for both international arbitration agreements as compared to other types of dispute resolution agreements and arbitral awards as compared to national court judgments. That means when the parties agree to resolve their dispute in a particular way, that promise will actually be upheld, upheld under mandatory international rules in 159 states around the world. And when the arbitral process is finished, when an award is rendered by the tribunal resolving the party's dispute, that award also can be recognized and enforced in those same number of countries. Those five E's are, in many ways, the pragmatic reasons that parties have chosen in an overwhelming majority of cases in recent decades to resolve disputes by international arbitration.
Thank you very much. That's really very helpful. And I also always say that uh, it's also a question of two parties because if you even don't like arbitration, you don't know about arbitration, uh, then one day you can have a counterparty uh, that uh, you want to enter into agreement with that will say, I want arbitration. I prefer arbitration, and that would be the choice whether you enter into the contract and you choose arbitration or don't enter into the contract. And for this case, you need to know about arbitration. So that's why when some people, for example, in the Far East of Russia, we have a division there, there say to me, why don't why need this arbitration? It's more expensive uh, than the state course. I say, just maybe we don't need it now, but one day uh, the Chinese or Korean or Japanese party or neighbors uh, the parties of Russia will come to you and say we want arbitration. You need to know about arbitration. So I think uh, all these five E's are really very important for such kind of relationships in different regions of the world, including Russia too. Thank exactly. There, and it's especially important in international cases. Domestic cases may raise, in some circumstances, different issues, different policy concerns. But internationally, as the universal character of the New York Convention demonstrates. Arbitration is essential to the to the flow of world commerce. Uh, but uh, at the same time, some people say that currently international arbitration is uh, undergoing through some kind of challenging times. Some even say about uh, lost promise of international arbitration, criticizing that uh, it failed to provide parties with a relatively quick and efficient uh, procedure uh, with a lot of expenses, uh, arbitration is becoming more complex, arbitration rules becoming more complex. Uh, so in your opinion, are these concerns are justified? And uh, from the perspective of arbitral institutions, what can be done in order to address these concerns and maybe counter this critique? Mm. That, that's again a, a great set of, of questions. They're in a sense not new questions or, or new concerns, they're, they're perennial concerns about about arbitration and to some extent perennial hostility by some national courts to the arbitral process. Criticisms of arbitration as a kind of second class or rough justice, suggestions that arbitration isn't quicker and cheaper but in fact slower and more expensive. In my view, many of those criticisms, all of those criticisms arise from, from misconceptions and misunderstandings of international arbitration today. International arbitrations are like snowflakes, they're like people, everyone is unique, everyone is different. There are international arbitrations that involve huge amounts of, of money, extraordinarily complex, factual, technical, legal disputes. Arbitrations that involve 30 or 50 billion dollars involve a long-term construction project that would take literally decades to complete and goes horribly wrong. Resolving that type of dispute on which each company's future depends and which could take national courts literally decades again to resolve won't be resolved cheaply and, and quickly and the parties won't want it to be. Those kinds of disputes take careful study by experts, by lawyers, by arbitrators as well. Those types of disputes take a long time to resolve by any means of dispute resolution, including arbitration. Importantly, in the last 20 years, one has seen commercial parties submit those types of disputes, not small disputes, not routine day-to-day -day disputes, but the biggest disputes that companies face, and sometimes that states face, to international arbitration. They have trusted the arbitral process to resolve those disputes expertly and even-handedly. In order for a dispute of that complexity to be resolved fairly and expertly, time is required, time and, and investment in, in people, in expertise. In my view, international arbitration is preferred by companies for those types of disputes because although it's expensive, it's less expensive than the alternatives, and that's the real question. Many disputes, however, are not those kinds of headline eye-catching <laughs> disputes involving 30 or 50 billion US dollars. Many international commercial disputes are more like traffic accidents. They involve $100,000 or a $1 million, $4 million. Not the types of disputes that for most companies, for major companies, determine their future, determine whether they will survive or not, but instead irritants in the day-to-day -day flow of international commerce. Those disputes need to be resolved efficiently and quickly, and I believe that international arbitration does that. It does it in part through innovations in procedural rules, 
that various arbitral institutions have adopted. At the Singapore International Arbitration Center, for example, we have introduced three procedural innovations. One, we've introduced emergency arbitration, which allows an emergency arbitrator to be appointed before an arbitration even begins within the space of one calendar day, who is required within the space of two weeks to issue emergency interim measures, freezing the status quo, assuming that the claimant, the party requesting such measures, has demonstrated the appropriate need for them. That provides a mechanism for ensuring that the party's rights are safeguarded while the dispute resolution process proceeds. Second, we have introduced expedited procedures. Rule 5 in our SIC arbitration rules allows an arbitration to be resolved through expedited procedure, provided that it is relatively small value, beneath an amount of around four and a half, five million US dollars, or alternatively, that it's a case of exceptional urgency, or if the parties mutually consent after a dispute arises. In all those cases, if the case is expedited by SIAC, then an award must be made within six months by the arbitral tribunal. Typically, the arbitral tribunal will be a sole arbitrator, again, to ensure that the proceedings will be expeditious and also that they will be cheap. The award can be in summary form and can be made without an in-person hearing before the arbitral tribunal. All of that ensures that the arbitral process for these types of small disputes will be expeditious and efficient. We've had in the last eight years since introducing this rule 480 or so applications for expedited procedure and have granted 275 or so of them, 60% or so. In my view, that demonstrates how the arbitral process can be efficient and expeditious for appropriate types of dispute. We wouldn't use that type of procedure, of course, for the $30 billion construction project that goes badly wrong. But for small cases, we would use that type of procedure. And in our consultation process in 2016, when we revised our rules, we asked parties around the world, businesses around the world, do you like this procedure, expedited procedure? Should we expand it? Should we enhance it? And they uniformly and enthusiastically said that we should. Other arbitral institutions have adopted similar mechanisms. The ICC now very recently has adopted a similar set of procedures. I expect other arbitral institutions to do so as well. Finally, like ICSID, the International Center for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, our third innovation has involved early dismissal. We've granted, we've affirmed, I think is the better way to put it, the authority of the arbitral tribunal to dismiss on an early basis claims that manifestly lack legal merit, as well as defenses that manifestly lack legal merit. We've also affirmed the arbitral tribunal's authority to dismiss on jurisdictional grounds at an early stage. All of this is meant to ensure that the arbitration won't go forward at great length on claims that are either frivolous or lack any serious basis. I think these are important steps that both we and other arbitral institutions have already taken and that we should explore other types of procedural innovations that will allow arbitration to, to be understood to have realized its promise. Thank you. That's great that you are optimistic. And uh, I also think that it's just the international economy relationships which are uh, changing. Uh, they are becoming more dynamic, uh, more mm -hmm. complex. So that's why these challenges are coming. But as you said, arbitral institutions are dealing with them step by step. And uh, it, also, uh, it also leads to changes in international arbitration. And so your to your seminal books, uh, international commercial arbitration, international one, arbitration law in practice, uh, have undergone through second editions not long ago. Uh, can you point out one or two most interesting trends that you noticed in comparison uh, with the first edition of this book when we were working on the second edition? And I'd be delighted to. Let me first, though, underscore a point that you made that I think really does, does warrant emphasis. International commercial and economic relationships, international legal relationships, have become vastly more complicated in, in the past 10, 20 years. Many, many relationships involve types of technology that one never envisaged 20 years ago. They involve legal rules that have developed rapidly, whether intellectual property or competition law or, or types of contractual relationships, which, which are relatively new. 
in the past, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, those disputes often would not have been arbitrated. They often are huge disputes involving multiple parties, involving vast amounts of money, involving huge long-term investments. One thinks of investments in the energy sector, which require multi-year commitments. These disputes today are resolved by arbitration. They're resolved by arbitration because businesses and also states have confidence in the arbitral process to resolve those disputes. One of the, one of the aspects of arbitration that makes it so attractive is that you can tailor the dispute resolution process to different kinds of disputes. Arbitration has responded to these new types of highly complex, very large disputes by using complex, intensive procedures. That's appropriate. That's what the parties want. Because those cases attract substantial attention, one tends to think that's international arbitration. But the reality is there's another, much larger set of cases that are very small and much less exciting, much less interesting in a way. They're the routine traffic accident type of cases. And that reflects a very important reality of international arbitration as well. It's less exciting in a way, but it is more realistic in another way. On my books, I think there are two principal differences between the, the first and the second editions. One, one, one trend that I noticed was a trend among national courts in, in different jurisdictions to look to one another's interpretations. One another's interpretations of, for example, the New York Convention or the UNCTRAL model law and international commercial arbitration to adopt reasoning that had been used in, in other courts, whether it's the House of Lords or the, the United Kingdom Supreme Court now looking to either US or German or French authorities, whether it's the US Supreme Court looking to international arbitral awards, whether it's courts in other countries, India, Singapore, elsewhere, looking to either civil law or common law decisions. And out of these different national court decisions, looking to essentially international instruments, the New York Convention, the UNCTRAL model law, and to other courts, other national courts' interpretations of those instruments, has, in my view, developed a type of international arbitration law, a common law of international arbitration that gives effect to these international instruments. I think that's an exciting set of developments that offers further promise in the development of international arbitration. Second, I've also seen national courts and arbitral tribunals as well develop new and and robust legal theories for giving effect to the arbitral process, whether it's the validation principle in the context of the validity of international arbitration agreements or the choice of law governing the substantive validity of arbitration agreements, or a pro-arbitration rule of interpretation of the scope of arbitration agreements, or a recognition of the arbitral institution's responsibility for providing an efficient and expeditious means of dispute resolution. All of these different types of developments have sought to reinforce the five E's that lead parties to arbitrate. And I think national courts working in tandem with arbitral tribunals have played a very important role in this public-private partnership that makes international arbitration successful. Yeah, so I think uh, you use the word common law for international arbitration. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, and I think uh, the Asian, uh, Asia-Pacific region has dedicated a lot during the last 10, 15 years to this experience, also for you as the author, because uh, you, uh, alongside with your uh, with your arbitrators, status, council status, academic status, you are also the president of SIC Court of Arbitration. And uh, uh, one of the most dynamically and uh, successfully developing arbitration institutions in the world, I think. Uh, so can you please uh, tell a few words uh, what uh, did make uh, SIC develop during the last 10 years mm -hmm. so progressively? And uh, is there a kind of Singapore arbitration miracle uh, because uh, I on, don't only speak about SIC, I also speak about Singapore as seat of arbitration in general because we see from the different surveys that uh, Singapore is becoming more and more attractive seat of arbitration. There is also ICC arbitrations uh, that are being hosted by the Maxwell Chambers in Singapore so, and other institutions. So can you please tell what's the secret <laughs> and is there a miracle? <laughs> 
I think there is a miracle of sorts. But before I, before I address that, just one word on the common law of international arbitration, because some civil law members of the audience may feel left out. And, and they shouldn't in that respect, because some of the most, most important courts in the development of this common law of international arbitration have been civil law courts. So courts in France, courts in Germany have played critically important roles. I would expect courts in Russia to participate in this development of uh, international law of international commercial arbitration. There are important contributions from all types of, of legal systems. One of those legal systems, of course, is Singapore. Singapore courts, like, like Indian courts, other courts in the region, Hong Kong courts, have played an important role in, in interpreting the New York Convention, applying the UNSUTRA model law. Singapore has been particularly striking in its success in the last 25 years. The, the Singapore International Arbitration Center, which, which I have the privilege of, of being the president of the Court of Arbitration at, was founded in, in 1992. It had a caseload of one or two cases for, for a number of years. Arbitration wasn't a particularly, particularly um, attractive um, means of dispute resolution in Singapore at that time. Singapore courts had very restrictive views of the lawyers that were permitted to participate in international arbitration seated in, in Singapore. And Singapore wasn't thought of by international businesses or, or lawyers as a seat for international arbitration. The government, however, and the legal community in, in Singapore made a deliberate choice in the early 1990s to change that. They made a deliberate choice to open the market to foreign arbitral institutions and to foreign law firms, to encourage foreign businesses as well as Singaporean businesses to seat their arbitrations in Singapore and also to use the Singapore International Arbitration Center's rules. They did so not by excluding foreign arbitral institutions, but on the contrary, welcoming them. Our, our headquarters, the SIC's headquarters, its home base and, and only case administration facility is, is in Singapore. We share space with the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce, our principal competitor with the Permanent Court of Arbitration, with other arbitral institutions in Singapore who have been welcomed by both the regulatory regime and, and by the government. The thought from the beginning was by encouraging other arbitral institutions to come to Singapore, we will enhance the status of Singapore as an arbitral seat and thus encourage more parties to use the Singapore International Arbitration Center. We at the Singapore International Arbitration Center have revised our rules progressively to make them more international. And we see ourselves as a global arbitral institution, not an Asian arbitral institution, but a global arbitral institution. We, in our most recent rules revisions, revised the provision for the default seat in the case of arbitration agreements where the parties hadn't specified the arbitral seat historically it had been Singapore, but we removed any default choice of a particular location, leaving, of course, the parties free to choose the arbitral seat, but also if they don't choose the arbitral seat for us or the arbitral tribunal to do so with no presumptive favoritism in, in, in the case of Singapore or otherwise. Other arbitral institutions in other parts of the world don't have that approach, that even-handed approach towards the choice of the arbitral seat. And we think, I think, that reflects the openness of, of Singapore to international arbitration. The Singapore courts and the Singapore legislature have also played a very important role in this process. Perhaps most importantly, Singapore adopted the UNSUTRA model law adopted it as the law applicable to international arbitrations conducted in, in Singapore and expressed a strong willingness to recognize foreign arbitral awards. Singapore courts have taken a very pro-arbitration, pro-enforcement approach towards both international arbitration agreements and arbitral awards. And I think all of these factors together, together with a very strong Singapore international arbitration community, have contributed to what you rightly called the miracle of international arbitration in Singapore. That miracle can be seen perhaps most tangibly by looking at that caseload, which I mentioned a couple cases in 1992, 1993, 
Last year, in 2017, we reported 482 SIC administered international arbitrations commenced in that calendar year. That's a number that is materially higher than some of our, our competitors, the LCIA, HKIC. And in our view, it brings us within striking distance of the ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce. Thank you. Um, so, uh, in your uh, treatise, International Commercial Administration, you had used a list of uh, uh, 19 leading arbitral institutions, which some refer as uh, world's finest. Uh, are there any specific features to make arbitral institution to qualify as world's finest? And uh, uh, what is your advice to the young arbitral institutions, such as Russian Arbitration Center, uh, in order to come closer to this uh, list of world's finest? So that, that, that's a list that continually evolves and changes over time, just as international arbitration and arbitral institutions change over time. Had I compiled that list in 1992, it would not have had SIAC on it, and some of the institutions that would have, have been on the list at that point would, would no longer, are no longer on, on the list. And so I think, I think it's important to see that as a snapshot at a particular period in time. And, the door isn't closed, and indeed, I think it's inevitable that 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 other institutions will be added. Some institutions will will unfortunately be dropped. That's part of the nature of the competitive process, creative destruction, as I think some famous economist remarked. What is it? What are the attributes that that lead an institution, not necessarily to be on my list, but lead an institution to be recognized by international businesses, international lawyers around the world as a credible international arbitration institution. I think there are a variety of factors. One, I think there needs to be a, a, a relative degree of, of experience. The arbitral institution must have demonstrated through the administration of a sufficient number of cases that it not only has a credible set of rules, one needs a credible set of rules, a set of institutional arbitration rules that, that are, are in accordance with best international practices, whether one takes those as the UNCITRAL arbitration rules or the ICC or the SIAC rules, but a set of procedural rules that, that make sense and that are consistent with international best practices. One also, though, needs, in addition to those rules, experience administrating them. One needs to have conducted a number of arbitrations, chosen arbitral tribunals, resolved challenges, scrutinized awards, made decisions about tribunals' compensation in a way that has resulted effectively in the conclusion of an arbitration, the making of an award, the final resolution of the party's dispute. One doesn't go to a doctor based just on where she went to, to medical school. One goes to a doctor because of the types of diseases she is cured in the past, the types of patients she's dealt with. One wants a doctor with experience, and exactly the same thing is true of, of arbitral institutions. I think one looks to various indicia to ensure oneself that the five E's are met by those arbitral institutions, in particular that they're even-handed, that they're independent from government involvement, that they will independently and impartially select arbitrators, that they will independently and impartially resolve challenges to arbitrators, that they will conduct the arbitration in a professional and independent manner and scrutinize the award, both professionally in the sense of making sure that the arbitral tribunal has done its job, but also independently in the sense of not interfering with the arbitral tribunal's ultimate responsibility for the decision. I think acquiring the reputation, the expertise, the experience that gives international parties confidence takes time inevitably. And in some senses it's, it's a little unfair because reputation always lags reality in a way. One can be administering arbitrations very effectively with an excellent set of rules, behaving in a professional and independent manner, and the world won't yet have realized it. It takes a little bit of time for people to actually catch up to, to the realities of an institution's practice, just like to the realities of a young arbitrator's practice. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, such kind of list is very good for competition and for development of arbitration and uh, arbitration institutions. Uh, but now going from competition to cooperation, uh, I would like to ask about your initiative, uh, initiative of SIC and you, 
that was uh, launched in the end of 2017, um, a cross-institution consolidation protocol. Uh, I would explain to, to the audience that it's a kind of initiative that brings to life the idea of uh, consolidation of different arbitrations that are being administrated by different arbitration institutions under different arbitration rules. Uh, I think it's really important from the point of view that we discussed earlier about economic uh, relationships becoming more complicated, a uh, set of contracts that uh, exist between the several sets of similar parties or some group of parties and uh, for sure there can be some different arbitration clauses and there is need to sometimes to consolidate uh, such kind of proceedings in order to meet these five key criteria for the arbitration and whole, yes, to make it efficient. Uh, so can you please tell just why you came out with this kind of idea and uh, uh, what is the development, recent developments in, in, this, in this sphere now? I, I'm, I'm glad that you asked about that because I think it's a, it's a good example of the kinds of things arbitral institutions can do to try to ensure that the promise of arbitration, of international arbitration, is, is fully realized. Not all of these suggestions will necessarily succeed. Suggestions for, for making arbitration more expeditious and more efficient won't, won't always be accepted, but I think it's very important that, that users of arbitration, international arbitration practitioners, continue to think on an active, on a proactive basis about how to, how to satisfy the, the promise of arbitration. As you rightly point out, international transactions have become more complex. They have become multi-party and arbitral institutions, including SIC, have adopted rules that are addressed to the multi-party and also multi-contract character of many international projects many international transactions. They've done so by introducing provisions for what are called consolidation, joinder, or intervention into their institutional arbitration rules. These provisions essentially, I'll, I'll oversimplify slightly, these provisions essentially let an arbitral institution or an arbitral tribunal consolidate one arbitration under an institution's rules, say ICC rules, into another existing arbitration or newly filed arbitration under that same institution's, the ICC's institutional rules. So instead of having two ICC arbitrations involving essentially the same dispute, essentially the same parties, essentially the same contracts, go forward separately at two times the cost of one arbitration and produce two results, possibly inconsistently, one will consolidate those two arbitrations into a single ICC arbitration with a single ICC arbitral tribunal that will make a single ICC award. That produces obvious savings in terms of, of cost and time and also reduces the risk of inconsistent decisions. We at SIC, HKIC, other arbitral institutions also have consolidation provisions, indeed broader consolidation provisions than many arbitral institutions. None of these institutions, however, none of these provisions for consolidation and institutional rules allow you to consolidate one institution's arbitration, say an ICC arbitration, with another institution's arbitration, for example, SIAC arbitration. You can't consolidate an ICC and an SIAC arbitration. We asked ourselves the question, why not? Why couldn't, just as parties consent by agreeing to ICC rules to the consolidation of two ICC arbitrations, why couldn't they consent to the consolidation of an ICC and an SIC arbitration? Of course, party consent would be absolutely mandatory. Consent is the foundation for international arbitration, and without the party's consent to consolidation, you couldn't have it. Our proposal, however, was for arbitral institutions to work together to cooperate instead of just competing, but to cooperate in developing a protocol which would be appended to part of the institutional rules of two institutions, in my example, the ICC and the SIC. This protocol would set forth procedures for how you could, in appropriate cases, consolidate in an ICC and an SIC arbitration. This, of course, would require the parties to consent to the relevant institutional rules. It would require the contracts at issue to be closely related. It would require the parties to the 
various arbitrations to be the same or almost the same. All the usual criteria for consolidation. The protocol would set forth the procedures and some standards for how you consolidated cases. For example, you would consolidate one small arbitration into two larger arbitrations under a different institution's rules. Those details need to be worked out in working group discussions, which we've commenced with one arbitral institution already, and which we're in the process of commencing with other leading arbitral institutions around the world. That's great news. And do you think that uh, new technologies can help in cooperation between arbitral institutions, for example, blockchain technologies? Um, uh, and uh, whether there shall be some kind of joint reaction to cybersecurity challenges uh, from the arbitral institutions, what do you think? I think, I think the notion of a, a joint reaction on cybersecurity issues and, and IT um, security issues is, is a very good one, and I think arbitral institutions should cooperate together on exactly that. I think new technology offers both exciting opportunities and to some extent frightening challenges to, to both international arbitration like, like other types of, of international commerce and, and other types of dispute resolution. I think that one can well envisage a time in the not too distant future when we will not need paper in arbitral proceedings and actually be able to complete the proceeding using electronic data and, and laptops. And in fact, that one won't need a physical hearing, that technology will allow witnesses to be questioned and lawyers to make their submissions just as effectively by video conferencing and other means of, of technical virtual reality um, that we today use in in-person hearings. I'm not sure that that will happen quite as quickly as a paperless arbitration, but I suspect that in the space of both our careers, we will see arbitrations that are conducted by hearings that are in virtual space instead of a real physical space. Yeah, and I also hope that new technologies will help to deal with these concerns of lost promise of arbitration too. Indeed, five indeed. Years, yes. uh, so this year uh, marks the 60th anniversary of one of the most important and successful uh, multilateral treaties in the field of arbitration, United Nations Convention on Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, Recognition and Enforcement, uh, which is called also New York Convention that you mentioned several times. Uh, how do you see the future of the convention and whether any changes are needed because 60 years is uh, long term? It, it is indeed the, the 60th birthday of um, the, the New York Convention, UN Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. And, it's been a fairly extraordinary 60 years in a sense. The convention started off to some extent inauspiciously. It wasn't signed by about half the various states that in the spring, early summer of 1958 negotiated and, and finalized the, the text of the convention. And it took, it took many years for, for many leading economies around the world actually to, to ratify the convention. Today, however, the convention is, is global. It's universal. It has 159 contracting states. There are a few countries, North Korea, some Pacific Island states that are not party to the convention, a few African states. But for the most part, the convention is, is a truly global constitution for international commercial arbitration. One could write books. Some people have written books about the New York Convention. In, in my view, though, the former president of the International Court of Justice, Steve Schwebel, summed up the convention and that 60-year history very well in just two words. It works. And in my view, if something works, then you don't need to fix it. If it's not broken, don't fix it, is an old English saying. And I therefore have very considerable skepticism about the wisdom of efforts to suggest a New York Convention version 2.0 or efforts to treat the existing convention as a, as a beta version. The existing convention, although being drafted quickly and although being in reality a page and a half long when you just look at the important articles one through seven, I think has a genius in its simplicity and to some extent flexibility. It combines a fairly extraordinary set of international rules 
rules that make private contracts, agreements to arbitrate, mandatorily enforceable as a matter of binding international law. 159 states have chosen to treat international commercial arbitration agreements in that unique fashion and also to treat arbitral awards in that same fashion, to undertake as a binding matter of international law to recognize those awards, in each case subject only to fairly limited international exceptions, quite limited and exhaustively defined international exceptions. At the same time, the convention has escape vows. It has escape vows for national public policy and so-called non-arbitrability, cases that are not capable of settlement by arbitration under national law. Those escape vows give na nations, give the contracting parties the possibility of avoiding their obligations under the convention in a limited set of cases where important national public policies are thought to demand. Importantly, countries around the world, courts around the world, have not made expansive use of those exceptions. They've, they've used that power to have an escape valve from the convention in a very guarded, in a very modest way. And in fact, they've developed international limitations on those exceptions. I think that is a very delicate, very nuanced, very sophisticated blend of international obligations and national flexibility that has been cared for in a very sensitive way by national courts. I would not disturb that very delicate constitutional balance which continues to evolve and which, going back to your question about the second editions of my book, which I've, which I've tried to, to capture in, in the successive volumes of my books, I think that is an important continuing development and I would not interfere with it. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the non arbitrability issue, and it was actually my uh, next question, because it's one of the grounds that I mean, your convention uh, is being studied by the state's courts ex officio, uh, just uh, as one of the grounds to refuse to recognize and enforce for an arbitral award. Uh, do you think that uh, there are any common law, civil law divide uh, that is traditional in many other aspects of international arbitration uh, for the question of arbitrability? And do you think there are any limits of arbitrability or there are no limits of arbitrability? Because, you know, in Russia it's a very sensitive question and very interesting for, for Russian practitioners. Non-arbitrability is an interesting, very interesting and, uh, and also important question. It involves one of these, these escape valves that I mentioned and it, it appears in, in two places in the convention in Article 2.1 with respect to the obligation to recognize international arbitration agreements, except when they concern a subject matter that's not capable of settlement by arbitration. And then in Article 5.2, where an arbitral award can be denied recognition, including, as you say, ex officio by a national court, if it deals with a subject matter that's not capable of, of settlement by, by arbitration in the law, under the law of the, the contracting state, uh, the, the recognition state. I think that national courts historically have exercised great restraint in applying these non-arbitrability exceptions. I think a very good example is a decision by the United States Supreme Court in a case called Mitsubishi Motors versus Solar Chrysler Plymouth. The issue there was whether an antitrust, uh, an anti-monopoly claim could be arbitrated or not. The parties had agreed to arbitrate that claim, but, but one party subsequently said that this agreement concerned a matter that was not capable of settlement by arbitration, that antitrust, anti-monopoly claims were too important or too laden with public policy issues to be resolved by private arbitration, and they could only be resolved by a, a U.S. state court. In the domestic context in the United States, that, that argument was correct. U.S. courts had held that domestic antitrust claims were non-arbitrable. But the U.S. Supreme Court, very importantly in the Mitsubishi Motors case, said things are different under the New York Convention. Things are different in an international context. There, we don't want to turn the convention into a kind of Swiss cheese with every country swallowing out a big hole from the convention, leaving it looking, again, like a, a piece of Swiss cheese with more holes than, than cheese. And so the court said that even though these claims would be non-arbitrable in a domestic context, 
they are arbitrable in an international context. We will not treat them as non-arbitrable. We will require that these claims be submitted to arbitration, and we will exercise whatever control may be necessary, if any, in the recognition process. I think that reflects the approach of other countries. The European Court of Justice in the Eco-Swiss case, English courts, Singaporean courts have, have adopted similar views. And I, I think that is an appropriate approach towards the non-arbitrability doctrine. It raises the question of whether that approach, in addition to being appropriate, is, is mandatory in a sense. Does the convention impose limits, international limits, on the non-arbitrability rules of individual contracting states? I think it must. It's obvious that the convention interpreted in accordance with good faith and the rules on the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties must impose some limits on a state's ability, on the one hand, to promise to recognize arbitral awards, but on the other hand, to say that essentially any commercial matter is non-arbitrable or any contract dispute is non-arbitrable. There clearly must be limits, and I think the challenge is defining those limits. I think that's why the process that I described earlier, this process of a common law of international arbitration is so interesting and, and so important. I think national courts will define over time limits, international limits on the scope of non-arbitrability doctrines. I think the essential focus of those rules will be on narrowly defined vitally important national interests, which can be non-arbitrable, but not on broader exceptions that undermine the basic character of the convention itself. Uh, thank you. I think, yes, so the, your convention creates very good basis for, for arbitration approach for the state courts and actually the direction of state courts and the uh, application by state courts in your convention. Uh, it makes the jurisdiction either pro-arbitration or not very arbitration friendly. Uh, in your opinion, what else can be done in order to promote pro-arbitration approach among state court and judges uh, in, in, in any jurisdiction? I think that um, events like this, <laughs> discussions about international arbitration law and, and policy, uh, discussions about the New York Convention and I also other. To translate your book maybe into that's different a, languages. <laughs> the book I has been <laughs> the book has been translated into into Mandarin in in China. The law and practice book um, has been translated in into Mandarin and and a Spanish translation is underway. I think law and practice in into Russian would would be a very very interesting idea. I think um, events in which um, members of the judiciary are um, given opportunities to learn more about the international arbitral process and the New York Convention are important. I think in every country, I can't speak for Russia, but I, I can speak for other countries, busy trial court judges who have very broad dockets of, of general jurisdiction understandably find not just the New York Convention, but any international treaty to be alien instruments. They're not things that they frequently encounter. They in a sense, push the, the judge's comfort zone. They worry about if they apply them, they'll apply them in the wrong way or they won't understand them properly. International law isn't always the thing that trial court judges in many countries or even appellate judges spend most of their time doing. And I think there's therefore a hesitation, a, a reluctance to, to dive into those international waters. And I think doing things to overcome that, that reluctance and instead to inspire the judges to participate in the public-private partnership that the New York Convention contemplates are, are very important. Thank you. Uh, let me ask the last question. Uh, so I, I said about when introducing you to the, to the audience, uh, I said that uh, you had more than 650 arbitration in the council and more than 275 arbitration as an arbitrator. So arbitration, uh, except of being great pleasure and training for mind, is also sometimes stressful, even co uh, complex disputes, yeah? uh, or just complex disputes are rather, rather difficult and uh, stressful. So how to avoid stress, mm -hmm. or if you have stress, how to get rid of it? So some hobbies? Can you give some recommendations? That's a good, that's a good question to, to end on. Arbitration is, in a sense, stressful. 
one can debate whether it's more or less stressful than national court litigation, but any type of adjudicative process is, I think, stressful. It's probably especially stressful for parties and, and for lawyers, counsel representing parties. It can also be stressful for arbitral tribunals them, themselves. And I think it's important not to let that stress undermine the basic, basic five E's, the basic purpose of the arbitral process. And also, to be honest, the basic purpose of life, which is um, having a, a productive and, and generous approach towards, towards other people. I think that finding time away from, from cases, whether as counsel or arbitrator, is important. I've chosen a peculiar path. I've chosen a path of using that time to write books about arbitration. For it's some, that might be even more stressful than being counsel, but for me, it's less stressful. When I sit down and write about some aspect of arbitration, when I discover some new secret about the Moscow Convention of 1972, which dealt with international arbitration, it revives me, it revitalizes me, it takes away the stress and lets me go forward feeling, feeling unstressed and willing to face new challenges. Thank you very much for this and thank you very much for the interview. You are always very welcome in, in Russia, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg and hope to see you again soon. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. <laughs>